The Golden Age of the Moor, edited by Ivan Van Sertima. The Moor in Africa and Europe, Ivan Van Sertima. 1. Origins and Definitions It is generally assumed that the movement of Africans into Europe in significantly large numbers and into positions of real power did not occur until the Muslim invasion of Spain in 711 AD. In al-Makari's history of the Mohammedan dynasties in Spain, however, we learn of a great drought that afflicted Spain about 3,000 years ago, a catastrophe that was followed not long afterwards by an invasion from Africa. This, of course, had nothing to do with the medieval Moors, with which this book is primarily concerned, but it is worth noting here because it actually established an ancient African dynasty in Spain a fact that is omitted from the official histories. The drought that devastated Spain, however, is described by a number of Spanish historians. Pedro de Medina, in Libro de las Grandezas de España, published in Seville in 1549, dates the drought at 1070 B.C. Ibn Khattab al makari in his major historical work translated by Pascal de Gallangos, describes it in some detail. It is al makari also who informs us of how Africans banished from North Africa by an African king against whom they revolted, entered Spain and took control of that country. The leader of the Africans is recorded as Batricus. What his original name was, we do not know, but it survives as Batricus in the Latin of the Romans because it was the Romans who defeated these Africans 157 years later. These Africans first cast anchor at a place on the western shore of Spain and settled at Cadiz. Advancing into the interior of the country, they spread themselves about, extended their settlements, built cities and towns, and increased their numbers by marriage. They settled in that part of the country between the place of their landing in the west and the country of the Franks in the east, and appointed kings to rule over them and administer their affairs. They fixed their capital at Talaca, Italica, a city now in ruins, which once belonged to the district of Isbilla, which is modern Seville. But after a period of 157 years, during which eleven kings of the African race reigned over Andalus, they were annihilated by the Romans, who invaded and conquered the country. The second major intrusion of an African army into Spain before the Moors occurs sometime around 700 BC during the period of the 25th dynasty in Egypt when the Ethiopian Taharqa was a young general but before he had been seated the throne by his uncle Shabataka. It is this same Taharqa referred to in early Spanish chronicles as Taraco that led a garrison into Spain and invaded it during this period. We have a clear and indisputable reference to this in a manuscript by Florian D. Ocampo, Cronica General, published in Medina del Campo in 1553. The name of the invading general is given as Taraco. He is not only identified as head of the Ethiopian army. The reference is more specific. It says he was later to become a king of Egypt. The name, the period, the historical fact of his generalship and his later kingship of Egypt, his Ethiopian origin, and the wide-ranging trade and exploration of the Ethiopian in this period all attest to the validity of this reference. But most persuasive of all is the fact that cartouches of the upper Egyptian kings of this period have been found in Spain. Evidence of such cartouches may be found in the Journal of Epigraphic Society, Volume 7, number 171, April 1979. The cartouche of Shishong, a Libyan king, was found in tomb 16, al Munikar, Spain. The Libyans ruled with the support of Nubian armies from the 22nd to the 24th dynasties and were overthrown by the Nubians in the 25th. The fact that Africans from the north had been intruding into southern Europe from very early times should not come as a great surprise, for the straits that separate the two continents can be crossed by the simplest boats in a matter of hours.
the proximity of the borders of Europe and Africa, and the evidence of the African phenotype among many Southern Europeans led Napoleon to remark that Africa begins at the Pyrenees. Many historians, however, make clear-cut distinctions between the early North Africans and the Africans of the Sahara. They contend that the Africans who made contact and left their mark on Europe should not be confused with the sub-Saharan African type. They see these people as Euro-Africans, another version of the brown Mediterranean race myth used to account for the genius of ancient Egypt. Since many North Africans in modern times seem to fit into this theoretical construct, it has worked very well to confuse and confound the definition of their ethnicity. Some of our contributors, although well grounded in their particular areas of expertise, are vague about the origins of the North African tribes and the complex of historical factors that have transformed the cultural and physical configuration of these people. This has compelled me to use my editorial mandate and overview to bring what I hope is a more decisive clarity to this matter. The people whom the classical Greek and Roman authors called Berber were mainly black and affiliated with the then contemporary peoples of the East African area. The word Berber was used in fact to refer to peoples of the Red Sea area in Africa as well as North Africans. It was an ancient belief that the nomads dwelling in the deserts of Arabia were the same peoples whose ancestors had in earlier times roamed the deserts of East Africa. It was such populations that largely comprised the Moorish people, called Moors, from the Greek Moris, the Roman Moris, or Dark, because of the attribute of blackness which sharply distinguished them from the bulk of the European people. However, the inhabitants of present-day North Africa are considered ethnically and culturally distinct from people dwelling south of the Sahara. This is only so today because of the considerable influx of European types during the white slave trade and their later movement in positions of dominance after the defeat of the Moors. The 700 years during which the Moors dominated the Iberian Peninsula was an era in which many Europeans came into North Africa in states of servitude. The Muslims brought millions of European slaves over to the North African parts of Sale, Tangier, Algiers, Tunis, Tripoli, Fez, and Marrakesh, and some of the northern Egyptian towns. One very famous sultan, Moulay Ishmael of Mekemes in Morocco, had as many as 25,000 European slaves who participated in the building of his colossal stables. Sudanese were also taken into slavery, but before the 15th century, not as many as the whites. It was these Europeans who began to modify through intermixture the earlier black inhabitants of North Africa. This is what eventually made so many North Africans appear different from the sub-Saharan Africans. The anthropologist Dana Reynolds, in an exhaustive and meticulously detailed essay, has attempted to trace the African roots of the original North African peoples. She cites half a dozen Greek and Byzantine Neo-Roman writers from the 1st to the 6th century AD who describe the Berber population of North Africa as black-skinned. Among these writers are Martial, Silas Italicus, Corippus, and Procopius. The original black Berbers, who were called Moors, were the North African ancestors of the present-day dark brown and brown black peoples of the Sahara and the Sahel, mainly those called Fulani, Tuareg, Zenaga of southern Morocco, Kunta, and Tibu of the Sahel countries, as well as other black Arabs now living in Mauritania and throughout the Sahel. They include the Traraza, of Mauritania and Senegal, the Magharba as well as dozens of other Sudanese tribes, the Chaamba of Chad and Algeria. Apart from her very detailed study of the origins and affiliations of the various tribes, she points out that the Africans involved in the Moorish occupation of Iberia did not just build remarkable things in Europe but also in their native lands. 
they founded and constructed many industrious and prosperous towns all over the north of Africa and as far south as Timbuktu. The ruins of their many castles can be seen as much in North Africa as in Andalusia. The evidence Reynolds presents to establish the Africoid base of the Berbers is challenged by Wayne Chandler, who insists that the Berbers were already heavily mixed with a Caucasoid element before the Moorish invasion. They were classified as the Tawny Moors and are to be distinguished, says he, from the Black Moors. They are the result of mixing of black Africans, the Garamantes of the Sahara, with a race of white Libyans. This clash of views has led to a stimulating debate. Let me state the case as presented by both contestants. At the heart of the history of the ancient Moors, says Chandler, are the Garamantes of the Sahara. The Garamantes were black Africans who occupied much of northern Africa. They can be considered the ancestors of the true Moors. Contemporary with the Garamantes were the Libyans. Originally, claims Chandler, these Libyans, whom Menes attacked and defeated in the first dynasty, were Caucasians. They were called by their black conquerors, Tamahu. In Egyptian, Tama means people and Hu is white or light ivory. Thus, they were the white or light-skinned people. Portraits of the battle between Menes and these people indicate, according to Chandler, that they were a different race from the ancient dark-skinned Egyptian. These light-skinned people intermarried with the many blacks on all sides of them, he claims, and became the Tawny Moors, or White Moors, also known as Berber from the Roman Barbari, or Barbarian. The Arabs adopted this Roman term for them and changed it to Berber. Eventually, the word Libyan and Berber became synonymous in some places. The Sahara, he contends, came to be occupied by two distinct groups, the original Moors, Garamantes, and the Berbers, who later became the Tawny or White Moors. The rest of North Africa, from Egypt through the Fezzan, and the west of the Sahara to what is now called Morocco and Algeria were peopled by black Africans, also called Moors by the Romans and the later Europeans. Eventually, these Moors were joined with Arabs to become a united and powerful force. Names like Tamahu, Dana Reynolds points out in a lengthy correspondence with me, while originally used for indigenous Libyans, came to be used for the foreign colonists and mercenaries. For the Egyptian artist, such names apparently possessed only geographical or national significance rather than ethnic or racial meaning. The earliest portrayals of Tamahu, however, rule out the idea that the word meant ivory or white-skinned people, as Chandler claims. A similar claim had been made for the earlier Libyan name Tahinu, but as O. Bates and more recently Vichtil point out, both of these names were first applied to men portrayed in Egyptian iconography with dark brown skins, and they were obviously of a different race and culture than the later blonde invaders. F. Berens, A. Arkell, and several other specialists in the archaeology of Nubia and the southeastern Sahara have come to see the C group culture as the population which was first designated Tamahu in the 6th dynasty. They were a relatively tall, slender, and obviously black population of pastoral nomads who came to settle in Nubia. The tombs they used belonged to the Berber kind found all over ancient North Africa. This type of man was, judging from the skeletal evidence and eyewitness accounts of early European historians, the predominant population of North Africa, even at the time of the first Arab penetration into North Africa. See Chandler's response in appendix to this editorial. In his discussion of Berber ethnic origins, Jose Pimenta Bay cites the views of Sheikh Anta Jop on the matter of the Moors and the Berbers. 
However, Jope is not particularly helpful. It is refreshing that Bay sees this very clearly and qualifies his support. Although he cites the master with respect, he does not follow him. Jope makes the unsupportable claim that the Berbers were post-Islamic invaders. His uncharacteristically uninformed commentary on the Moors led me to delete that section of his otherwise remarkable paper, which it was my honor to read at the Nile Valley Conference held in Atlanta in 1984. On the poor state of mathematics and astronomy in Europe at the time of the invasion, Jupp was his usually perceptive self, but he must have mixed up time levels in a hurried look at the Berber. Sources on the Moors also seem to be rather sparse in French. It is possible that General Martel's defeat of the Moors and their virtual expulsion from France may account for this. Professor Latfi of Morocco University, whom Bay also cites, in no way proves the contention that the Berber and the Moor are synonymous terms. They probably were, but it is certainly not established by any of Latfi's arguments, which indicate an Africoid element but considerable ethnic diversity among the Berbers. Such contradictions can only be resolved by concentration on specific time levels and an ability to demonstrate conclusively how this web of ethnic threads sprang from a single node. Only Reynolds offers this type of concentrated argument and documentation. Bay, however, provides the most wide-ranging and well-researched thesis done so far to establish the great debt Europe owes to Moorish scholarship. The essay of Runoko Rashidi and James Brunson provides us with one of the most comprehensive examinations of the use of the word more, but they concede that it is still difficult to arrive at the precise ethnicity of a Moor through mere terminology alone. The fact that the term was originally intended to refer to a black or dark-skinned person, as they have shown, does not mean that everyone called a Moor is African or of African descent. The Arabs themselves rarely used the term Moor. They often used the term Berber for the non-Arabian people of Northwest Africa with whom they came in contact and who joined with them in the invasion of Europe. The early Christians also used the term Saracen indiscriminately to cover both Moors as well as other Muslim populations in general. Readers of the recent popular edition of The Moors in Spain by Stanley Lane Poole will seldom find references to color but a frequent use of the word Saracen. The Moors, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, are people who are commonly supposed to be black or very dark and it is synonymous with the word for Negro in many contexts. Rashidi and Brunson provide numerous examples of the synonymity of Moor with Black during the European Renaissance and earlier. The word runs like a ripple across a vast pool of languages. During the European Renaissance, explorers, writers, and scholars begin to apply the term Moor to Blacks in general. A prominent example of this tendency can be found in the work of Richard Hakluyt, a 15th century traveler. Hakluyt recorded that in old times the people of Africa were called Ethiops and Negrite, which we now call Moors, Morans, or Negroes. In the Romance languages, Spanish, French, and Italian of medieval Europe, Moor was translated as Moro, Moar and more. Derivatives of the word more may be found even today in these same languages. In Spanish, for example, the word for blackberry is mora, a noun which originally meant Moorish woman. Also in Spanish, the adjective for dark complexion, which now means brunette, is moreno. We find a similar legacy in the French language. In French, moricard means dark-skinned or blackamore, while morillon means black grape. Again, as in Spanish, the Italian word mora means negro or Moorish female. Also in Italian, mora means blackberry, while moreola means black olive. 
As pointed out above, the Arabs rarely used this word. In Arabic literature, the word more was fairly non-existent, and the term Berber was applied to practically all the inhabitants of the Maghrib, Islamic North Africa, west of Egypt. The Arab use of the word Berber presents further difficulty since the term embraces many clans, not all of whom are black. It is because of this that Rashidi and Brunson, as well as the anthropologist Dana Reynolds, have gone to the trouble in certain contexts to identify those Berber clans of Africoid or predominantly Africoid origin. The most important identifier, of course, is to be found in medieval painting and sculpture. It is claimed that certain Islamic traditions inhibited the representation of the human image in the work of Muslim artists and even in cases some medieval Persian art, for example, where this inhibition does not seem to have obliterated portrait art. The human image is often frozen, non-individualistic and unreal. We are grateful, therefore, that in spite of their prejudices, the Christians left vivid images of the Muslim black. While the black figure at times takes on a demonic quality or emerges as an exaggerated caricature of the African, these paintings and sculptures are an indisputable witness to his presence and importance in this period. Such illustrations are to be found in the Cantigas of Santa Maria, allegedly written by Alfonso X, 1254 to 1286. They are filled with images of the Moor and are mostly black types. This is the period of the Almoravid invasion, which brought hordes of new Africans into the Iberian Peninsula. Medieval illustrators in the Cantigas portray blacks in a variety of roles, from members of the aristocracy to the military. Included among the images of medieval Spain is a black man receiving gifts from a caliph or emir. In another illustration, two noble black moors are shown playing chess while being attended by black and white servants and musicians. Also, in the army of the Almoravid, black moors are shown not only as foot soldiers, bowmen, lancers, and horsemen, but high-ranking officers. This needs to be emphasized since historians have repeatedly presented blacks in these contexts as mere palace guards, harem keepers, and muscle-mounted mercenaries. Let us not pretend, however, that racism just rolled over and died when it was struck by the lightning of Islam. There were more positive black images, to be sure, in the Quran than in the Bible, far more black figures emerging as supreme powers in Islamic lands than in the lands of European Christendom. God created man of black clay, says the Quran, and the scandalous story of the curse of Ham, which gave so many bigots an almost divine justification for despising blacks, had no place in the Islamic scriptures. Where in the legend of the early Christian world could we find figures like the black general Ubadah, who commanded the surrender of Egypt from Europeans, or a revered black like Bilal among the first companions of the prophet, a third pillar of the faith, who brought the infidel forces of Syria to their knees, Search as hard as you may through the Christian pantheon of heroes and you will never find the likes of Yaqub ibn Yusuf, also known as Al-Mansur, who ruled Morocco from 1149 to 1189 and invaded Andalusia twice, becoming one of the greatest of the Moorish rulers of Spain. And on what throne in Europe, save in the Muslim domains, sits one comparable to Ibrahim al-Mahadi? black poet and musician who became ruler of Syria in 686 AD and was elected 25 years later as caliph of all Muslim Spain. As St. Clair Drake points out, making a very serious qualitative distinction, the election by elders of a black to rule all of Muslim Spain makes this, in spite of the presence of color prejudice which Islam mediated but could not obliterate, very different from the system of color caste that would eventually develop in the New World diaspora. What led to this qualitative difference? According to Professor Drake, the cultures conquered by the Muslims adopted the Arabic language along with the Muslim religion and thus contributed to an international Arabic culture 
that was distinct from an Arabian culture characteristic of the Arabian Peninsula. This international Islamic high culture had a tendency to transform color prejudice into an attitude that was subordinated to other values. Islam modified racial prejudices. It did not eradicate it. In Islam, as in Christianity, there has always been tension between its universalistic teachings and its application in concrete situations. The kind of social relations that existed in specific time and places in Arabia, rather than abstract conceptions of color values, were the decisive determinants of concepts about black people and attitudes toward them. Specific times and places rather than abstract conceptions. This is very well put and brings clarity to a situation that is sometimes irritatingly ambiguous. How can the black rise to the top of the world in some places, while in others apparently dominated by the same general conception? He is paralyzed and stifled. There are zones of relative mobility, as in Spain, which Drake calls the periphery, and zones of relative rigidity, as in Persia and Turkey, which are seen as the central lands. Even in liberalized Spain, however, there was the problem of race. But was it simply race or the rivalry between power groups? Rashidi and Brunson note the so-called bias of the Arabs. With the conquest and settlement of Spain, they contend the Arabs developed patterns of racial bias towards the Berbers. This bias, sometimes blatant and at other times more subtle, manifested in various ways. They cite disproportionate tax assessment and poor land allotments, but they give an even more disturbing example of racial bigotry. After founding the Almohad dynasty, the Berber ruler Abd al-Mumin offered the post of secretary in Grenada to an Arab poet, Abu Ghaffar. Because Ghaffar had to work beside the black sultan's son, he hesitated because he felt the dark-skinned Berber was far below his own intellectual standards. One can well understand how this asinine arrogance led to hostile feelings, open rebellions, and shifting allegiances between the Arab, Berber, and Christian factions of the Iberian Peninsula. This essay presents us also with a portrait of the Christian Moor, St. Maurice, and concludes with an introduction to the African presence in early Arabia, highlighting the African substratum of the ancient Arab world. 2. Influences and Contributions A distinction should be drawn between the classical renaissance of Europe, which mainly relates to its literature and art, and the scientific renaissance, which began to bud and flower in the 12th and 13th centuries. Jose Pimenta Bay deals primarily with the Moorish stimulus for the latter. He sets out to prove in his essay, and does so with a formidable body of evidence, that the foundation of much of medieval Western science and its academies was built up upon the transmissions, refinements, and discoveries of the Arabs and the Moors. Moorish influence came primarily to the West by the way of the Iberian Peninsula, renamed Al-Andalus by the Moors. Bay provides us with a detailed examination of Western Europe's scholarly relations with Spain. Translation, of course, played the major role in this diffusion of the sciences. The schools of translation were like the bridges between the Muslim and Christian scholars. Chief among these was the school of translators founded at Toledo by Alfonso X during the 13th century. Translations from Arabic, the medieval language of science, into Latin, the classical European language, had been going on since the 10th century. Centers of translation sprang up all over Christian Europe. Barcelona, Tarazona, Leon, Segovia, Pamplona, Toulouse, Béziers, Narbonne, Marseille, Bologna, Salerno, and Paris made extensive use of Moorish scientific treatises. The translations from the Arabic provided links between Spain, Portugal, France, Italy, and England. Alfonso X promoted Moorish erudition at every opportunity. 
the first university of Christian Spain was founded at Valencia by Alfonso VIII in the 13th century and the teachers employed were the Muslims and the Jews. Nearly all the major universities in Europe sprung up around the same time, beginning in the second half of the 12th century right up through the 13th, a span of about 150 years, a period which coincides with the flowering of Moorish science and the establishment of centers in Europe to translate Moorish treatises from Arabic into Latin. In Italy we have Bologna, Padua, Naples, Rome, in France, Montpellier and Toulouse, in Portugal, Lisbon and Coimbra, in England, Oxford. Several of the Moorish works in mathematics, astronomy and medicine became standard text at these universities. For example, Judwal, a Moorish work in astronomy, became a standard text at Oxford. Frederick II founded a university at Naples in 1224 and there he established a curriculum which emphasized Moorish scholarship. Under him all theological studies ceased at Italian universities and Moorish medicine and law became the major disciplines. A curious schizophrenia developed among the Catholics in relation to Moorish science and knowledge. On the one hand, they were very much aware of the superior knowledge of the Moors and they made efforts to acquire that knowledge so that they would not be left too far behind. At the same time, they strove desperately to keep it away from the common people and even at times to vilify it so that it would not become a challenge to Catholicism. They were afraid that the Enlightenment, the new ideas that this new knowledge would bring, could affect the populace, so that even though they were given the keys to the inner sanctum, they kept the cage closed to the masses. Into Europe came the great advances of an empire more immense than those of either Alexander the Great or Rome at its height. Rice was introduced into Europe by the Moors in the 10th century, cotton by the 9th. A Moorish botanist, Ibn Basal, partitioned the land into 10 different classes according to particular characteristics and taught the farmers ways of increasing the fertility of their plots. Surveys were done to locate sweet water below the earth. Widespread use was made of the water wheel, which the Moors had introduced into Spain. The Romans also knew of this, but they had used it very little. The Moors also dug canals and channels to irrigate the farmlands and provide water for the thousands of houses and mosques and palaces and public baths. They not only increased the fertility of the soil with their new methods and tools and plants and measures, but they also ushered in the sciences of food preservation and storage. They could store wheat for as long as 100 years. Their methods of drying enabled such food as figs, plums, cherries, and apples to remain edible for several years. They have left the voice print of their language on the things they introduced. A lot of Arabic words have entered general usage as a result of the Moorish invasion of Europe. They cite coffee, sugar, rice, cotton, lemon, syrup, soda, alcohol, alkali, cipher, algebra, arsenal, admiral, alcove, magazine. Let me add a few to this list selected from my own work on pre-Columbian navigation and the transfer of plants. Anchor from Angar, Caravel from Caravos, Tobacco from Dubak, and series of Taba and Tagba words. Also the technical terms for astrolab, an astronomical device invented by the Moors, still retain their Arabic names. But technology in itself is not the only arbiter of civilization. It is important to note a benign African influence on the way Islam operated in Spain, particularly in relationship to women. Ibn Battuta, the Arab traveler and writer, first commented with astonishment on the level of freedom and equality of Muslim women in the African town of Wolata. It was the same in Moorish Spain. Unique among Islamic nations, women enjoyed more societal freedoms than in any part of the Islamic world. They moved freely in public and engaged in various gatherings. The practice of purda was almost entirely ignored in Moorish Spain. Even a daughter of a 12th century caliph had a total disregard for the veil. 
A question that has always haunted me is the reason for Europe's dark age. Why did Europe fall into such darkness after all it had received from the Greeks who had taken so much and added what they could to the Egyptian sciences? George G. M. James in The Stolen Legacy answers this question. James had pointed out that the edicts of Theodosius in the 4th century closed down the temples of the Egyptian mysteries as well as the philosophical schools of Greece. The Emperor Justinian in 529 AD followed in the same path of Theodosius. Thus an intellectual darkness descended over Christian Europe and the entire Greco-Roman world. It lasted for centuries. But I feel James exaggerates when he claims that, quote, the Greeks showed no creative powers and were unable to improve on the knowledge they received, end quote. His point about their borrowings is well made, but this kind of chauvinistic remark is quite unnecessary. There is no need to suggest the Greeks were dumb and could make no improvements, whatever, on what they learned. If that were true, the influence of the Egyptians would have been negligible. But James makes an even more important point, which I have not seen repeated elsewhere. It is the missing link in the drama of Moorish scientific ascendancy in the Middle Ages. Eurocentric historians had argued that the Arabs were merely transmitting the Greek heritage lost to Europe during its Dark Age. Even Arabs were made to believe that and to assume that they were standing on the shoulders of Greek giants. By the time they attacked Egypt, Europeans had long been in charge of that defeated country. The Arabs seemed to forget that their conquest of Egypt had been made easy by the resentment of the Egyptians against their Byzantine overlords. We know far more today about the enormous debt Greek science owes to Egypt. See my essay, The Egyptian Precursor, in this issue. But what was little suspected was that Greece was not the only conduit of Egyptian scientific genius to the Arab world. James provides evidence that there were Egyptians fleeing their country in large numbers during the Persian, Greek, and Roman invasions, fleeing not only to the desert and mountain regions, but also to adjacent lands in Africa, Arabia, and Asia Minor, where they lived and secretly developed the teachings which belonged to their mystery system. In the 8th century AD, the Moors of North Africa invaded Spain and took with them the Egyptian culture which they had preserved. Knowledge in the ancient days was centralized, that is, it belonged to a common parent and system, the wisdom system or mysteries of Egypt, which the Greek used to call Sophia. Whatever we may say of these great scientific advances, there is something that we cannot gloss over and which unfortunately we must mention in our uncompromising quest for the truth of history. Some despots and merchants did trade in slaves during part of the Moorish occupation of Al-Andalus. Most of these before the European slave trade were European slaves. It has been said that slavery among the Muslims and slavery among the Catholics had important differences. Bay quotes Joseph O'Callaghan, who, in the history of medieval Spain, makes it clear that, quote, owners did not possess the power of life and death over them, nor could they inflict excessive punishment. Slaves had rights, and they could actually seek assistance if they were exceedingly maltreated. On this matter, Bay comments, any student of American history knows that this was far from the case regarding the British and United States system of enslavement. The enslaved African was a non-human legally designated as property. Slavery, regardless of these qualifications, can never be condoned or forgiven. But it was not central to their system. It was marginal. I think it should be also pointed out contrary to myths about the Muslims, that they did not force their religion down the throats of the Christians. John Jackson, in an informative chapter on the Moors in his book, Introduction to African Civilization, shows us how Christian, Jew, and Muslim were treated with equal respect during the dynasty of the Umayyads. We have been given no evidence that this changed dramatically in later Muslim dynasties. The slave trade in this time was not a state institution. It was like the lucrative drug enterprise of today, a large but lawless thing. 
sometimes indulged in by bad rulers, but not a keystone of the system, as it was later to become in the Euro-Christian world. The Moors, let it be said, did not suppress the languages of the people of Al-Andalus. They did not outlaw their sacred customs. They did not turn Iberia into a sweatshop, its fertile lands a mere source of raw materials for the Muslim international elite. They did not destroy their legal system, rob them of their political rights, deny their claim to humanity. The one thing they did insist on was a say in the election of the Catholic bishops since the rival power of the church could undermine Muslim power and authority. The world changed dramatically in 1492, not only because Columbus stumbled in the direction of the Americas using the magnet of a myth to draw millions behind him, but because that was the very year the Moors were defeated. It is not an accident that it is Spain and Portugal who spearheaded the movement in this direction. It was on January 2nd, 1492, that the African leader, Abu Abdi La, otherwise known as Bobadil, surrendered to the Spanish. Jan Carew compares the illiteracy of the Christian Europeans to the learning and erudition of the Moors of that time. The comparison is so startling, his comment is worth quoting. At a time when the most insignificant provinces of Moorish Spain contained libraries running into thousands of volumes, the cathedrals, monasteries, and palaces of Leon, under Christian rule, numbered books only by the dozen. The paltry number of texts the Christians did possess were almost all devotional or liturgical. The narrowness of vision this produced among leaders of the church and state was to have catastrophic effects. It led to the massive burning of African and Arab books under the ordinal of Cardinal Jimenez de Cisneros. It inspired a similar bonfire of the books of the Native Americans. Bishop de Landa exhorted his followers in the Yucatan, Burn them all, they are works of the devil. The destruction of the Moorish libraries was particularly vicious because it was not only inspired by religious narrowness and bigotry, Hatred of the dark invaders kindled the bonfires. The church at the time, too, saw most of this foreign learning as something evil, even demonic. The number system that we use today, for example, brought in by the Moors from India, was seen as late as the 17th century in some parts of Europe as signs of the devil. It became a religious mission for men like Jimenez and his successors to erase from history all memory of the Moors. Jimenez even induced the Spanish sovereigns to outlaw the public baths, making cleanliness antithetical to godliness. Fortunately for the scientific renaissance, key Moorish works had already been translated and circulated, even smuggled secretly into the academies, significant seminal inventions introduced and established before these barbaric attempts at an intellectual holocaust. Beaten into surrender, forced by the millions to seek refuge back into Africa and Arabia, some of the Moors still held their ground. An important rebellion by the Moors is cited by Karu in 1568, led by Mulavi Abd Allah Muhammad ibn Umayya. This was such a serious rebellion that Philip II of Spain had to call on Don Juan of Portugal to put it down. Karu deals with the subtle evasions by Europeans who refused to admit that the Almoravids, 1056 to 1147, were Africans. They continued to describe them variously as descended from the Sanhaja tribes of the Sahara, or the Desert Sanhaja, from whom the Almoravids had first drawn support, suggesting that Almoravids themselves were of a different race, and that they got the Sanhaja to help in their campaign or the African troops, the Sanhandra. While he notes that the Arabs later developed a myopic vision of history, ignoring the African contribution, he praises the early Muslim open-mindedness. For, after all, Islam went beyond the Arab, and in its early revolutionary phase, its eagerness to embrace the universe of man's imaginings was extraordinary. Unlike Christian theologians who forbade scholars from considering ideas outside of the prescribed ecclesiastical canons of the day, Islam accommodated new ideas with grace and a civilized tolerance. 
let me quote from him again since he highlights the advantages of this kind of dynamic openness very well. Muslim scholars absorbed and synthesized and expanded upon the knowledge of the Ethiopians and Egyptians, the Phoenicians, the Greeks, the Chinese, and the Indians. A new and momentous leap forward in the theoretical and applied sciences evidenced itself in Moorish mathematics, medicine, astronomy, navigation, and new concepts of world geography and philosophy. The popularity of Moorish scholarship was such that for centuries Arabic was commonly accepted as the language of scholars from Europe, Asia, and Africa. His essay is particularly illuminating when it comes to the discussion of agriculture. The Moors transformed the Iberian Peninsula in this respect. They were able to create a harmony in the rhythms of the life in the city and in the countryside. They not only brought advanced drainage and irrigation systems, reservoirs, aqueducts, sophisticated storage facilities and efficient marketing, transportation and trading networks, but they brought the beauty and freshness of the countryside into the cities. Fantastic gardens, parks, lush inner courtyards, and a constant supply of pure water. They also brought a variety of new crops, like cereals, beans, and peas of various types, olives, almonds, and vines, rich new sources of protein. Fruits unknown to Europe tumbled into the market. Oranges, pomegranates, bananas, coconuts, maize, and rice. They brought the art of dry farming as well to the high bleak plains and they introduced the water wheel, as I mentioned earlier, an invaluable source of energy for irrigation and the grinding of grain. The impact of the Moors upon European literature and upon the work of great writers like Cervantes and Shakespeare is also rarely discussed. Carew points out that Spain's greatest literary figure, Cervantes, was for several years prisoner of a Moorish leader in North Africa. The tales of knight errantry and courtly love which obsess Cervantes' hero Don Quixote were filtered through centuries of the Moorish Islamic experience. There were Moorish brotherhoods that may be described as orders of knights. Their imprint on European heraldry, on shields and emblems of chivalry is dealt with elsewhere in this work. Now Shakespeare, though he never traveled, had many merchant friends from whom he could milk information about Morocco and the Moors. He also knew Queen Elizabeth's ambassador to Morocco and the Moroccan ambassador to London. Shakespeare also, I should point out, read Leo Africanus's Geographical History of Africa and quotes actual sentences from this in his play on Othello, The Moor. He wrote an ode to his Moorish mistress, Lucy Morgan of Clerkenwell, and seems to have taken a greater interest in the black figure than any other English dramatist of consequence. Carew touches on his treatment of these, from the noble Moor Othello to the caricature of the black slave Caliban, round whom the racist prejudices of Elizabethan England are crystallized, to the dark-complexioned prince of Morocco, whose color is cancelled out, in his rivalry with the pink prince of Aragon for the hand of Portia, by what Shakespeare sees as the grand equalizer, wealth and class. The image of the Moor in European literature, however, an occasional though powerfully evocative figure in the plays, novels, and canvases of major European writers and painters, seems rather minimal in its effect on literary or artistic structure and form. Not so in the matter of music. The influence of African and Arab musical instruments, poetry and song, even musical theory on the melodies and rhythms of Spain, shine through the lies and evasions of musicologists to this day. Yusuf Ali, drawing upon a comprehensive body of work on this subject, tries to set the record straight. A major misconception about African music is that it has always been separable from what became the Arab-speaking countries of Maghrib, Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt, and the Sudan. The tendency of most people, even scholars who should know better to confuse ancient and modern social and ethnic reality, has led to serious misunderstandings about racial and cultural origins of the people of North Africa as compared with Africans in other parts of the continent. The Maghrib is seen as a thin finger of Islamic culture that stretches from Egypt to the Atlantic. 
and what it was before the advent of Islam or the European slave trade is ignored or forgotten. We shall not attempt to prove here, since we have done so definitively in other volumes, that Egypt, in the classical dynasties at least, was predominantly African. But what is seldom recognized is the African substratum of ancient Egyptian music. This music was to spread and influence both the Eastern and Western world. It haunted and startled the Arab, even as he was startled by the pyramids and sphinxes and colossal monolith, which in his desert habitat he had never seen. Experiments in ancient Egypt with a music notation system and the establishment of schools of music that not only taught vocal and instrumental performance, but also theory and chironomy, the art of notation by means of gesture, made Egypt the first civilization to do so. Egyptians, even as late as Greek times, were still possessors of canted knowledge in both music practice and theory. Thus, much that we credit to Pythagoras and the Greek music theorists have deeper roots in Alexandria and the Nile Valley. In addition, the legacy of ancient Egypt is found in the shapes, tunings, and playing styles of such folk instruments as the Argol double clarinets, the Genebri of North Africa, the many end-blown flutes of the Near East, the Helam of the Wolof, and the Sistrum of the Ethiopian Copts. Ali devotes a long section to acquaint his readers with the spread of the Arab language east, north, and west across Africa. What he is trying to say, and the Encyclopedia Britannica adopts the same attitude toward this problem, is that since any Arabic-speaking African would be referred to as an Arab, one can be misled into making clear-cut distinctions between the Afro-Semitic or Euro-Asiatic, Arabian, and the Arabic-speaking African since there are so many instances where such distinctions would either be blurred or misleading. He thereby avoids the racial problem to some extent by seeing the Arab Moreso as a linguistic and cultural grouping rather than someone with a clear-cut racial identity. This approach has the value of freeing him to discuss the innovation and impact of the alien invaders on Andalusian music without having to distinguish the fair-skinned Arabian, say from the dark-skinned Berber of the medieval period. It is an approach, however, that has its dangers since the stage may be spotlighted with singers and players who are sometimes marginal in an examination of the African contribution to the music of the world. Music performed by the Berbers of Morocco, he demonstrates, is traditionally African. The Black Nawa, a community or tribe of griots or storytellers, perform a large part of the traditional music. They are also found in Tunisia and among the Wolof of Gambia. Ali points to a mixture of styles, as among the Wolof, and emphasizes that this synthesis, reflecting both a Muslim and a pre-Islamic African element, may be found throughout the fringes of the Sahara. He cites the work of an important African musicologist, Kebede, who asserts that an indigenous and truly African style of music cuts across Africa, north to south and east to west. Kebede says that Egyptian civilization is the cradle of music and that even the Greeks refer to Egypt as the source of their musical pedagogic ideas. Ancient Egyptian music is preserved today in the music found in the Coptic churches and it is also deeply rooted in the music characterized simply as Arabic. The controversy over the African root of the Berbers which runs through the essays of Reynolds, Chandler, and Bay, flares afresh in the citations of Ali. Graham tells us that the music of the Berbers has nothing whatsoever to do with Arab influence, but represents an ancient African style. What is remarkable and brings us back once again to brood upon the inspirations of Egypt is that the Arabs came there with their poetry, but nothing formally set to music. They did not yet have a classical form of music that they could call their own. There is no evidence of musical treatises in Arabic. Ali informs us until the 8th century. This is after their invasion and their study of Egyptian music practice and theory as translated and transmitted by the Greeks. 
Virtually all European scholars, however, claim a Persian origin of Arab music, even though they know, or at least should know, that the first Persian musical treatise dates from the 12th century, about 400 years later. The most significant of the Moorish musicians was Zuryab. He arrived in Spain in 822. He was known as Zuryab, the blackbird, a name given to him because of his black complexion, his eloquence, and the melodious sweetness of his voice. Zuryab made not just an impact on the music of Spain, especially in the development of the lute, but he became the cornerstone of Spanish musical art. In Cordova, he founded the first conservatory of music. He also invented a plectrum made of eagle quill instead of the wooden one that had been used before. He was deeply versed in every branch of art and he was gifted with such a remarkable memory that he knew by heart upwards of 1,000 songs with their appropriate airs. Before Zuryab, the lute was composed of only four strings which may be likened to the four elementary principles of the body. They expressed the four natural sounds. He added another red string and placed it in the middle which considerably improved the sound and made it more harmonious. The theory of humors which the Egyptians introduced into medicine and which had been picked up by the Greeks and through their translations by the Arabs was now transferred to music. The object of music was to restore the equilibrium of the soul in the same way that medicine was supposed to restore the equilibrium of the body humors. Zuryab became the most fashionable arbiter of taste in the ninth century. He affected the way the upper class of Andalusia ate at the table. He was the first to introduce crystal tableware. He changed hairstyles. He introduced new customs in perfumes and deodorants, in the manner of washing clothes and cooking. He brought in new dishes, some named after him. He introduced new fashions in dress, a greater range of colors and textures of garments to suit the shift and change in seasons. He revolutionized the style of serving and eating food. Food was no longer served in one mass, as was the general case in Al-Andalus before him. Following his lead, it was broken down into separate courses, beginning with soups and ending with desserts. Apart from musical composition, instrument making achieved a high state of development in Moorish Spain. Some of the new instruments include the Cayel, the carizo or reed, the lute, the rata, the rabel or rebec, the kanun, harp, the munis, the quinira, a type of zither, the quitar, the zolami or oboe, the chakra, and the nora or flutes. Other wind instruments mentioned are the pastoral flute, the Moorish pipes, two kinds of flagellate, and the bagpipes. The percussion instruments include the bambrel, the tambourine, castanets, brass rattles, makara, and the atambor. Even when the Moors had been defeated and Christians had reconquered the territory once occupied by these people, the music was imitated by a great number of Christian Europeans and the Christian kings still kept Moorish musicians in their employ even as had the Moorish kings before them. Ali refers to a study of songs in the Concinero de Palacio, which contains the instrumental and vocal compositions of the Moors, who were the professional musicians at Alfonso X's court. Of the hundreds of songs examined in this work and the Cantigas of Santa Maria, the vast majority fit the pattern of the Andalusian metric system and are in the Zahal form the Moors created in the Andalusia toward the end of the ninth and the beginning of the 10th century. Their influence on musical instruments in Europe was considerable. They were the first to introduce a scientific description of musical instruments and possessed the only didactic instrumental methods in music during the Middle Ages. While most commentators agree with this, they insist that their influence was confined to that category and that they contributed nothing to musical theory. The historian of music, George Henry Farmer, points out, however, that since there was such an advanced state of instrumental music, it would be difficult to deny that some practical theory 
would have also been passed along. Indeed, says Farmer, I believe with others that the major mood due directly to the accordatura and fretting of the Arabian lute was among the new musical ideas introduced in this way. He also cites evidence for the transmission by the Moors of practical theory. Mamadou Chinyilu deals with the pivotal role of Africans in the birth of the Islamic faith and shows that they figure not only in the Prophet Muhammad's lineage but in his upbringing and development. St. Clair Drake points out and with supportive evidence that Muhammad himself was described as being of a red color. However, the ten sons of Abd al-Mutalib, Muhammad's grandfather, were all, according to D.S. Margoliuth, men of massive build and of dark color. This would not make Arabs see Muhammad as a black man in the popular American sense. We must remember that we are dealing here with polygamous families and the sons of al-Mutalib were probably not only of different wives of different races, but the particular son who fathered Muhammad may also have married women of different races. This therefore would not automatically make Muhammad black or Africoid. Phenotypically at least, he does not appear in that light to the Arabs. The way color prejudice had to be dealt with again and again with stern sermons by the Prophet makes it clear that the majority of his followers could not have seen him as such. A stigmata was still attached to people with classically Negroid features, St. Clair Drake tells us. His work is particularly informative on this delicate point. Black Africans, however, figure very prominently in Muhammad's life. Apart from the reputed African ancestry of his grandfather, Chen Yilu points out that he was reared by an African woman, Barakat, when his mother died. He pleaded with his family to raise money to free the African slave Bilal, who not only became a pillar of the faith, but his closest and most honored friend unto his death. One of his wives, May, was an African. His adopted son, Zaid ben Harith, destined to become a great general, was also an African. Muhammad held Africa in such mystical reverence that when his early followers were fleeing persecution in Arabia, he advised them to seek asylum in Africa, for yonder lieth a land of righteousness. Africans were pivotal also in the spread of Islam. The invasion of Spain in the 8th century and the survival of the Muslim dynasties in the 11th owe a great deal to African military prowess and leadership. Chinyilu celebrates the military exploits of Tariq, who conquered Spain in 1711 AD, of Yusuf ibn Tashafin, leader of the Almoravides, who routed Alfonso VI's army in 1086, 15,000 Africans facing 70,000 Europeans. Assuming leadership of Muslim Spain in 1091 and of Yaqub al-Mansur, who conquered Spain and Portugal on two separate occasions to become the most powerful ruler in the world. Such was the respect these leaders inspired in the hearts of their enemies that royal crest and coats of arms in Europe were emblazoned with Moorish heads. To the influence of Moorish science on Europe we finally turn, for it is in this field that the impact of the Moors is least known and most felt. Wayne Chandler points to advances in mathematics, the solving of quadratic equations, and the development of new concepts of trigonometry. He informs us that Moorish chemistry refined upon gunpowder invention in China and thus introduced the first shooting mechanisms known as fire sticks. They were also known for their skill in medicine. For seven centuries, the medical schools in Europe owed everything they knew to Moorish research. Vivisection, as well as dissection of dead bodies, was practiced in their anatomical schools, and women, as well as men, were trained to perform delicate surgical operations. They were the first to trace the curvilinear path of rays of light through air. This discovery in about 1100 AD is a prerequisite to the design of corrective eyeglasses. Students and teachers should read this essay also for its outline of main events in the dynasties, which no other writer in this volume attempts except John Jackson. 
Jackson's single-stranded definition of the moor, however, does not begin to address the complexities of the problem. Beatrice Lumpkin and Siham Zittler focus upon the work of mathematics in Africa during the Muslim Empire. Most of this work was done at the Dar el Hikmah, the House of Wisdom, founded in Cairo in 1005 AD. These scientists, through the use of Arabic as the common language of learning, were able to communicate with their colleagues over vast stretches of territory under Muslim influence, from Spain and Italy on the west across Africa and Asia to China on the east. They promoted the rapid progress of technology in this period. Even before the House of Wisdom was established, we have evidence of complex machines developed outside of Europe, self-operating valves, timing mechanism and delays, worm and pinion gears operated hydraulically, even crankshafts. The first steam engine had already appeared in Africa, built by Heron in the Egyptian city of Alexandria. Also the water clock and the thermometer. Europe lagged behind in the technological race and later profited immensely from these innovations. Edward Scobie deals with these aspects of Moorish science that made the global expansion of Portugal possible. Why did the British, French, Dutch, and Italians who owned the ships not undertake this journey? Since their leaders also possessed the necessary vision for such an enterprise, why didn't they take the lead? The Portuguese jumped ahead because they drew upon everything they could from the Moors. The geographical couloir for the Muslims traveled the length and breadth of the then known world and wrote the most meticulous travel accounts, Ibn Battuta and Ibn Hawkel, for example. All the advances in navigation, latine cells, astrolabes, and nautical compasses, astronomical tables, tubes, to the extremities of which ocular and object diopters were attached, the measurement of time by pendulum oscillations, the finest maps, also gunpowder and artillery. The Moors had not only made the fire stick, as mentioned above, but even cannon forged from wrought iron. Prince Henry the Navigator, born 1394, gets all the credit for the impetus toward Portugal's expansion, as if this was a result of his creative genius. The depletion of precious metals in Europe due to the demands of foreign trade, the costly wars that were taking place, leading to even further shortages, pushed Europe to turn to Africa as an untapped source. But it was Prince Henry who channeled both this need and the science of the Moors to spearhead European expansion. As Professor Hamilton puts it, it was both the lore and the lure of Africa. Why did the perception of the Moor change? Why was there no doubt before 1492 that one was dealing with a mix of racial types speaking Arabic among whom the black African was at times a dominant figure, whereas in 1992 it would seem like racial chauvinism to suggest that Africans played a major role in the occupation and enlightenment of a critical part of Europe. The crash of Moorish power in the middle of the 13th century, although this lingered on in enclaves like Grenada until 1492, was to make a tremendous difference. It is not an accident that the year Columbus sailed was the same year the African generals in Grenada surrendered to Ferdinand and Isabella. Not only did the economic and political fortune of Africa fall dramatically after that, but so did the very image and perception in which its people were held. It was only a matter of time before it would be seen in all lands and in all phases of history as unrelated to significant cultural and scientific development. Wherever it could be shown that the African had made early and significant advances or had influenced other civilizations, be it in North Africa, Southern Europe or Egypt, it would be seen as a direct result of some Caucasoid minority in their midst or the infusion of European blood. This led European historians to assume that there had to be a Caucasoid origin of or a Caucasoid class or caste above such extraordinary people as the Moors. Egypt, the depository of traditions of incalculable antiquity, had submitted after a brief and determined struggle to the common fate of nations, and the banners of Islam floated in triumph from the towers of Alexandria and Memphis. 
It was with a feeling of awe and wonder that the fierce, untutored Arab gazed upon the monuments of this strange and to him enchanted land. Before him were the pyramids, rising in massive grandeur upon the girders of the desert, the stupendous temples, the mural paintings, whose brilliant coloring was unimpaired after the lapse of fifty centuries, the group of ponderous sphinxes, imposing even in their mutilation, the speaking statues which facing the east with the first ray of light saluted the coming day, the obelisk sculptured upon shaft and pedestal with the eternal records of long extinguished dynasties, the vast subterranean tombs whose every sarcophagus was a gigantic monolith and the effigies of the old Egyptian kings, personifications of dignity and power holding in their hands the symbols of time and eternity. The influence produced by the sight of these marvels on the destiny of the simple Arab whose horizon had hitherto been defined by the shifting sands and quivering vapors of the desert, by whom the grandeur and symmetry of architectural design was undreamt of, was incalculable. History of the Moorish Empire in Europe S. P. Scott, 1904 Professor Scott may have exaggerated the simplicity of the desert tribes who overwhelmed Egypt in the 7th century A.D., but with respect to the impact of Egyptian science on the latter Muslim invaders, the vaulted tone of the above passage carries not the slightest hint of exaggeration. The irony is that the Muslim invaders came upon inscriptions and papyri that they could not read. They were therefore to draw upon the vast body of ancient science secondhand through the translations of the Greeks, the students rather than the teachers. Thus even they, in spite of their later refinements and advances, subscribed to the notion that they had merely built upon an original European base and that their real contribution to the scientific renaissance in Europe was largely to preserve and transmit the lost secrets of a Hellenistic heritage. This notion pervades even the latest works done on science of the Muslim peoples. Rome Landau, in his recent book, The Arab Heritage of Western Civilization, repeats this like a compulsive chant in every chapter. While Europe lost the Greek legacy, he claims, the Arabs discovered it. Again, the Arab assimilation of the Greek treasure forms one of the most fascinating chapters in the history of man's quest for knowledge. Two pages later he is still chanting the same tune. They gradually erected on Greek foundations an intellectual edifice of their own. No field of Greek learning, from philosophy to math, medicine and botany, was neglected. Since most modern Egyptians represent a dramatic departure, both racially and culturally from the Egyptians of the dynastic era and have been taught by both British and French imperial powers to follow the Eurocentric approach in these matters, we will find this dismissive attitude towards the science of ancient Egypt even in the most devout, the most learned of Muslim scholars. Such is the case of Saeed Hassin Nasser, author of the most recent encyclopedic work on the science of the Muslims. It exudes with a spirit of superiority over the so-called materialistic vision of the European, but in a typically schizophrenic vein, it rarely ever mentions pre-Islamic Egypt as having a scientific tradition. It is the same Eurocentric chant in spite of his chauvinism. Praise be to Allah for Aristotle and Plato, Pythagoras, Euclid, Hippocrates, and Galen. We have gone beyond this, sure, but before these Greek spirits there is nothing but the womb of space. That is why I have found it necessary to outline important aspects of Egyptian science as it bears not only upon the Greek but upon the latter invaders of Egypt. See my chapter, The Egyptian Precursor to Greek and Arab Science, which illustrates in a courtroom judgment the case against the main Greek plagiarist Archimedes and Pythagoras. A later version will provide supplements to this indictment. It is important that readers be made aware of this African background since it is difficult, if not impossible, to distinguish at all times 
African Muslims from other Muslim scientists. What we can say about Moorish science is that it was not European in its seminal inspiration and only minimally affected by Europeans before 1492. It was a multicultural tradition involving strong African and Arabian elements but also elements of the Hindu, the number system for example, and the Chinese gunpowder technology. Science ideally is beyond racial classification. It is neither black nor white, African nor European. What one man invents becomes the common property and benefit of the whole human race. But when there is a perceived attempt, conscious and unconscious, preserved and relentlessly over the centuries to minimize or exclude the contribution of people of a certain race, then an emphasis upon those invisible people in history becomes a duty, a mission, a necessary corrective. It is not that we seek to denigrate the achievements of the Greek, nor to subtract one iota from the contribution so loosely labeled as Arab, but to point out that there are seminal antecedents to the Greek that are too critical and significant to be ignored, and that both ancient and contemporary African element mixes and melts in the crucible that became the science of the Moors. Appendix to Editorial Rebuttal to letter of Dana Reynolds on the Tamahu by Wayne B. Chandler. In reviewing the summary of Dana Reynolds' section on what constitutes a Berber, several factors come to mind. First, in addressing her statements pertaining to Berbers, I find it necessary to explain what seems to me to be the obvious. There is no question that there are groups of black Berbers in the northern countries of Africa, but my task was to identify and trace the origin of a particular group or segment of this Berber population which came to be known as the Tawny Moor. That these so-called white Moors existed is irrefutable, for there are not only litanies of written documentation but scores of painted renditions of these Berbers to remind us of their presence in the Islamic conquest and construction of North Africa and Spain. Thus, it is not by my design that we are able to trace these groups through the chronicles of the Arabs, Romans, Garamantes, Carthaginians, and Egyptians. For Reynolds to refute such obvious data is uncharacteristic of her high degree of scholarship. Using anthropology, etymology, and quoted comments from the Egyptians themselves, we have no trouble in tracing the Tawny Moor or White Berber to the group known as the Libyan and from the Libyan to Tamahu. Beside the historical accounts of these whites, which is demonstrated on the famed palette of Narmer Menes, if we are taking into consideration visual evidence, and the statuary of Rehotep and consort Nofret, we have the written testimony of these white Libyans on the Wadi Maghara, which contains several memorials to the ancient kings of Egypt. The Wadi Maghara states that in the 6th dynasty, Pepi I was the conqueror of the Tamahu, the foreign people who in his time dwelt in the Valley of Caverns. This is testimony from the horse's mouth. Who are we to refute it? A pictorial representation of four races of men is found on the tomb of Seti I. Of these four races, each a different color, we find men arranged in groups of four each. One of these is the European and is depicted as white as snow with the designated inscription Tamahu. Reynolds quotes Berens and Arkell stating that in the Tamahu they identify a sea group culture which was quote tall, slender, and obviously black. What makes this so obvious? And who is stating this? Barons and Arkell? Reynolds? Or a third party whom Reynolds is quoting? Her statement suggests she is quoting someone else who is quoting these sources and that they have not been thorough in their research. Etymology in this case is unwavering and inflexible and states most assuredly that the Egyptian word Tamahu means the white people. In regards to Reynolds' comments on the Tihanu, it has been acknowledged by Egyptologists and historians alike 
who have correctly translated the hieroglyphs, that this group was of the black race. Job, writing in 1955, states, The Tihenu, or Black Lebu, was probably the ancestor of the modern Lebo. These blacks preceded the Tamahu, or white Libyans, in that region of the western delta. The existence of the first black inhabitant, the Tehenu, made it possible to create confusion over the term brown Libyan. As historians, it is our responsibility to convey an accurate account of what has transpired in our past. We must at all costs refrain from the same tactics employed against us by the European historian, for, as we have seen, this approach leaves a void which is easily filled with the truth, making it easy to refute all lies and scholarship which is based on deception. That among the predominant black types, there was also an Euro-Asiatic species of man in Egypt from a very early historical period, is fact. That they in latter times came to be known as Libyans is also fact. That these Libyans amalgated with the indigenous blacks of the area, which eventually produced what came to be called the Tawny or White Moor, is also irrefutable. Reynolds cannot afford to misrepresent the historical ledger because she wants to paint the entire population of Africa as black when there is substantial evidence to the contrary. I have no doubt that in most cases Dana Reynolds' approach to history is impeccable, but in this matter I find an oversight in her categorizing of the Tamahu and their relationship to the Berbers. I do agree, however, with her assessment of the black Libyans and the historical role they have played during and after the Arab conquest. End of part one. The Moor in Africa and Europe.